Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I am so excited to introduce everyone to the Polynary Posse. Um, the Polynary Posse is an organization dedicated to creating pollinator friendly landscape and uh, fostering appreci appreciation of the local ecosystem through outreach and education um, with eco-friendly landscape techniques at the heart of their work. The Polynary Posse crew teaches respect for nature, which keeps uh, Northern California blooming. And they ambition a day when life changing through inspiring green, green spaces will um, grace every corner of the Northern California and the world. Um, I actually met Tora two years ago and she told me about the organization. And it was then that I knew that I definitely wanted them to speak uh, with Sustainable Solano and our network. Um, so again, thank you so much Tora for being here um, and Terry also from the Planet of Posse. Um, and without further ado, um, please get, let's get started. Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Tora Rocha. I'm the co-founder of the Pollinator Posse and this is Terry Smith. She is the other co-founder um, and she'll be monitoring the chat. So if you can start putting your questions in the chat, um, she can start answering some, otherwise we'll have a little answer, question and answer at the end. Um, so let's get going. I'm Tora Rocha. Um, I was a park supervisor for the city of Oakland. I worked for the city of Oakland for 37 years, as most of it as a gardener. Um, and then I was a supervisor of all of downtown and Lake Merritt district, where I was a supervisor over the gardens at Lake Merritt. Um, and we do an annual fundraiser there called the Autumn Lights Festival that I'm also in charge of. Um, and for all the work that we've done in Oakland, creating pollinator habitat and creating these fundraisers, I won the Jefferson Award a few years ago, 2019, which is um, a pretty big honor. Um, I was very humbled by that because I didn't realize people even knew what we were doing. So um, that was, gave us even more um, energy to keep doing what we're doing. And um, I'm sort of the landscape end of this, um, this organization. And Terry is the educator. She's um, the educator um, side of this. I don't know. Okay. And then here's Terry Smith. She is the president of the community of, for Lake Merritt, a co-founder in Piedmont Connect. She's a STEM or STEAM education specialist and teacher um, and naturalist and, and a phenomenal artist and gardener. Um, so if you have questions, like if you're a teacher or a STEAM camp or something like that, it would go towards Terry. She also answers all the emails on our website. Um, and our main focus is to learn, to educate, observe, report, protect, plant, and collaborate. Um, we're now a proud partner of the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a national organization. Um, and we're doing a bunch of surveys, um, some really important citizen science that's going on with us. Um, and we'd love to get more people to help us with that. Uh, we have a web page called pollinatorposse.org. And all of our talks, a lot of our talks are under resources where you can see your past talks or future talks. We also have plant lists, um, everything you can think of. Um, we're trying to, we're gonna be rebuilding it pretty soon, but um, you're welcome to get information off of that and to share it. I don't know what's going on. Um, we have a Facebook group. It's not a page, it's a group. Um, we have, I think, 1,300 members now on that group and a lot of information. That's where we put, like, what's going on and, you know, keep track of things. And other, we also share other information that other organizations that we work closely with, um, we share their ongoing posts and, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's a great, it's a great group. Oops. Why focus on pollinators? Um, it's because they are the ones that create, they are the reason that plants can propagate. Um, and, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like, they're, you know, why are plants important? Let's start with that. Um, it's food, medicine, clothes, dyes, fuel, shelter. It maintains environmental balance and stability, provides habitat for everything. But we don't look at the stewards of plants as a very important 
you know, position in this in this country. We 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 think it's like an unskilled labor position, and that's what I want to change in the world. Um, plants need pollinators to reproduce. And there's a lot of different pollinators people don't even think about, you know, wasps, bees, beetles, rodents, hummingbirds, butterflies, bats, you know. Um, we focus mostly on the conventional ones, the bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, but we do, we're getting broader and starting to work on, you know, hoverflies and all the other important pollinators in the world. And that's what we'll talk to you about today. Um, I got my epiphany when I was a park supervisor. Um, I realized that the work we do um, affects the local pollinators. And the way it happens is um, I went to a talk, um, somebody doing butterfly gardening, and then I saw the documentary called Queen of the Sun, and it was about the, the decline of bees. And that night I woke up and realized that it's not just pesticides and habitat loss, and it, it's it's everything we do in landscaping. It's how we look at landscaping. And so if you're a gardener, I hope, I would assume that a lot of you out there on this talk are gardeners. I don't ever want you to call yourself just a gardener again, because if you put your hands in the dirt or you're raking leaves or you're planting plants, you're a steward of our local ecosystem. And you should be proud of what you're doing and think differently about what you're doing but also learn about how your practices could be harming the ecosystem or helping the ecosystem. And that's what we'll do today. So if you're out there, I want you to pat yourself on the back for wanting to garden and wanting to help protect pollinators because that's why you're on this talk. Um, feel, pat yourself on the back and tell, you know, know that you're super important to this planet. Gardeners are really important because everything needs plants to survive. Um, and I realized that being a landscaper and, you know, for me as a park supervisor, that I can change the perception of what the public thinks about the, the, the landscaping by informing them and, and educate them about what we're doing. I used to get these emails about weeds around Lake Merritt. People would like 50 emails would come in about why aren't you weeding this area? And I went out there and it was, it was plantain and it was thistle and it was, fennel, it was things that pollinators need to reproduce and to get nectar. So I put these signs up around the places that I didn't have the staff weed. And the same 50 people called me and said, thank you for what you're doing. So it was just perception that why do we call those things weeds? You know, it's actually, it's the way we look at landscaping and we're making everything aesthetically pleasing to humans instead of realizing how what we're planting is affecting our local ecosystem. So I started putting these signs up and I realized people really want us to do the right thing. Um, and they just were so happy that we were, you know, doing pollinator habitat. And I like to use the, the plant plantain as sort of an example of why we call things weeds. Plantain is this thing that most people like they have in their lawn and they'll weed it out. They'll use weed and feed and leave the lawn and um, take out the plantain. But plantain is a host plant, which is a plant that uh, certain butterflies can only lay their eggs on a certain family of plants. And plantain is for the buckeye butterfly, a host plant. But in Chinese medicine, they use it for asthma. They make tea out of it and treat asthma. And it's also a poultice, like if you get a bee sting. It's really, it's a great antiseptic. If you crush it and then put it on your, um, your wounds, it's a great plant. So why is that a weed? It shouldn't be, it's an important plant for the planet. But so I tell people with the pollinator posse, don't weed out your plantain, weed out your grass and leave a plantain lawn. You know, think differently, you know, it's like lawns aren't really serving much. So, um, it's, it's like I said, the perception of what is a weed and what's important. Um, I realized that a lot of, I started learning about native bees when I got this epiphany that I needed to start educating the public and my staff and volunteers, because we had hundreds of volunteers, that when I removed the deadwood in parks to make the trees in the park safe for humans, I was removing the habitat of native bees. And I realized that nobody we're nobody was talking about native bees. They're only talking about honeybees. 
And so to educate the public, I asked the director of public works if we could have um, the maintenance staff build this um, Airbnb, we call it now, because instead of a B hotel, because um, we had Airbnb employees help us um, work in the garden and they don't do hotels, they just do Airbnbs. So we named it the Airbnb. Um, and it's for native bees who use woodpecker holes and beetle holes and dead wood. But I was removing the dead wood you know, in parks to make parks safe for humans. And so I built this to start people, you know, get people talking about native bees and not honeybees. Honeybees are not native. Um, they are from Europe. We brought them here and they're actually livestock because they're domesticated and we maintain their hives. And they're not what's doing the main pollination of all the open spaces in California. It's, it's native bees. And nobody knows how many, you know, nobody talks about the native bees. There are 1,600 native bees just in California alone. Did anybody know that? 1,600 different species. But we only talk about honeybees. This has to change. And native bees are not hive makers. They don't have a queen. They don't have a bunch of workers. Most of them are single females doing all the work by herself, looking for a place to lay her eggs. So we do a lot of outreach with kids where we have them make little tiny bee condos with birdhouses and put straws. And we tell them that they're helping the single moms of the bee world. 30% um, of them are wood cavity nesters. Um, and they come in all different sizes. Like the one on your right is, I think it's your right. I'm hoping it's your right. <laughs> the, the large black bee is the carpenter bee. That's the largest of our native bees. And the... Um, other bee is one of the sweat bees, I believe, and it's tiny. There's a, there's even a tinier little native bee, a poppy bee, that is so tiny, you would never think of it as a bee. Most people think they're flies when they see them, or wasps, but these are actually the pollinators of our open spaces. And if you farm with them, um, it's proven now that native bees, you'll get a 25% higher yield on your crops if you, if you pollinate with native bees versus honeybees because they don't take the pollen and the nectar back to feed their young the way a, honey, a, hive of native, a hive of honeybees do. They just, and the males don't go back at all. They just plop from flower to flower. So it's proven now that they're better at pollinating. So there's 70% of them are ground nesters. Like you see the little solitary bee in the dirt. Um, a female will go and lay her eggs and then seal these chambers shut. Um, the other ones use reeds or wood. And you can see that one um, sealing the end of the tube shut with whatever material that particular bee uses. There's leaf cutter bees will use leaf matter. Um, and then mason bees will use mud. So if you have like dead wood and you see holes, but you see it packed with something, um, you wanna leave it. Like this is a little bee hotel we put up in the soldier garden up in Auburn, California with some high school kids. And you see the green, like on the leaves, you'll see the little green um, holes plugged. And right there, there's a little mud on that one. So different leaf cutter bees and mason bees moved in. And this was put up in April and these, this picture was taken in June. So they started using it right away. Oops. Um, this is a map that um, Terry actually put together for us. This is where the native bees are missing, the bright yellow. And if you look at it, um, you can tell it's where the most agriculture is happening. Because if you're tilling the ground and you have ground nesters, you're gonna kill the native bees, but it's mostly about pesticide use. You know, and our big ag is using way too much pesticides and they've been doing a lot of testing on the pesticides and it makes honeybees really sick, but it kills the native bees. In some of the um, farms in like Kansas, Nebraska, the, where they use these neonicotinoid um, uh, pesticides on their seeds, they found no native bees at all in the areas. I mean, it's really wiping them out. So we need to get on board and, and force, you know, it's about consumer and buying organic produce is the biggest, the, how you can help the biggest way and demand that, you know, farmers change our ways. We focus a lot on butterflies in our organization because they're sort of like 
the gateway into pollinators because they're so beautiful and people really respond to them. Um, and it's easy to get people to want to do something about them. It's hard. I always say we kind of pimp out the butterflies because we can't send bees home with kids. So, um, but they have been, it's been a very successful way to get people into um, caring about pollinators. And here's our, some of our local ones that you should see within your area. Um, the monarch, the cabbage white, the anise swallowtail, gulf fritillary, pipe vine swallowtail, which was extinct in Oakland. And um, we did a project and we brought them back to the flatlands of Oakland after I think 40 years, Terry, they were missing about 40 years. Um, Terry is like actually got tons of them in her house now in um, and she's close to the flatlands and it's a very, very, um, we're very proud of that project. And all it did was we just had to plant the host plant that it lays its eggs on, which is the California pipe vine. Um, it, this is, if you really care about pollinators, you have to know the whole life cycle because you, especially with butterflies, the adults, they need nectar but the caterpillars only will, they, the butterfly lays the egg on a host plant. That's what we call it because it hosts the eggs and the caterpillars. Um, and every butterfly has their own family of plants that they will lay their eggs on. And everybody knows about monarchs and the monarchs have milkweed. So that's what's in this picture is milkweed. And they lay their eggs on the milkweed. The butter, the caterpillar will hatch. It'll live its whole life out on that, um, those plants. And it's usually from, it's about 18 days. It goes from egg to chrysalis. And then it goes into its pupa stage where it goes into a chrysalis, not a cocoon. Cocoons are what moths do. Um, butterflies have chrysalis. And then the butterfly will come out of that chrysalis in about two weeks normally. It is temperature controlled. So if it's hotter, they, they go through the process earlier, quicker. And um, if it's cold, it, it takes a little longer. But knowing, so when you're doing a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden, you have to plant for all the life cycle. You have to plant nectar plants for the parent, you know, for the butterfly, and then host plants to attract the, um, the butterfly to lay eggs and caterpillars. Here's one of our projects we did with one of our um, volunteers where he did the life cycle of all these different butterflies, and he photographed the, um, the eggs, the caterpillar, the adult, and everything on his four-year-old's hands. And so we use this banner to, to educate the public when we go to festivals and such. Um, knowing the chrysalids, because you can plant the right plants, but if you don't maintain your landscaping gently, you could be removing the pupa stage of all these insects. And that's what I find the most distressing for me um, is that people over manicure their yards. So if you were in your garden and you saw these things on the plants, would you even know that there's actually a butterfly in there? They look like dead leaves, right? And most people cut all their plants back in the winter. Well, you probably were removing all of these chrysalis. That's an anise swallowtail up here and it ties itself to a stick. Um, and there's a gulf fritillary over here and it usually ties itself to the pipe vine, I mean, to the, passion vine that it um, will lay its eggs on. And most people just prune them back in the winter. So it, you have to know what they look like and to prune more gently, quit wiping out things in the winter um, or, you know, learn to identify them. Um, most of, a lot of them will go to fences or in the side of a house. They want to be protected from the weather. Um, but you know, so gently prune. I make, when I was teaching my staff, I, when they go to prune like salvias or sages, I just told them to look out for these. And if you do find them, just cut the stick above the chrysalis and below it, and then just tie the stick to another plant you're not going to prune and just leave it for the winter. And if you're raking your dead leaves, there's um, several butterflies that their, their caterpillar will drop to the ground, roll up into a dead leaf and wait out the winter. So if you're raking your leaves and putting them into your compost bin and hauling them away, you're probably wiping out generations. Um, and if you look at leaves and the parts of your the garden as, you know, it's, it's a cycle. And nature worked all by itself before we got involved. 
So rake your leaves under your shrubs. Don't put them in your compost and let them become the compost because that is where compost comes from is, you know, is green matter and brown matter mixed up. And then, because I see people do that all the time, rake up their leaves, then they run out to the store and buy compost and then put it down in mulch. And I'm like, if you would have just put your leaves there and sprinkle a little compost, you would have saved yourself a lot of money. So you must, you know, it's, it's learning the cycle. Um, this is the, this is a monarch caterpillar going into pupa. Um, it will hang there like a J, a backwards J, and then the chrysalis is actually formed inside the exoskeleton of the caterpillar. And it'll wiggle its skin or its exoskeleton up to the top and throw its exoskeleton, including its head off, and then stay in this pupa stage for about two weeks. Oops. And here it is in the, this is the monarch caterpillar, monarch um, pupa. So when it's newly formed, it's green. And then in about two weeks, 10 days, depending on the weather, it, you will be able to see the butterfly inside. So actually the outside of the chrysalis is actually clear. And this green goo that you're seeing is the liquid of the caterpillar, that the caterpillar became just was a liquid from the milkweed. Um, that's why it's green. And it's a pretty phenomenal thing if you think about what's going on inside. Um, and then the butterfly will come out. And I'm going to let Terry talk about what's going on with monarchs, because I'm sure a lot of you have seen what's going on on the news about the numbers. And she just went down to Pacific Grove and got to spend the day with the clusters. So Terry, why don't you tell them what you saw and what's going on with the monarch population? Yeah, so I'm sure you've seen headlines about it. It's been all over the papers and the news and so on that we had basically this tremendous crash in the population over the last three years. We went from an average of about 200,000 on the coast in the winter uh, down to 30,000 for two years, which was considered kind of the the start of an extinction vortex um, was described to me by one person. Um, and we were wor really worried about that. And then last year it dropped down to 2000 total individuals on the coast. Now there were some other things, behavior changes going on and we were actually seeing them inland for a longer period of time, but that was still incredibly concerning. Um, scientists burst into tears when those numbers came out because they felt like it was over. And some of them even pronounced it over. And then the butterflies did what butterflies can do. And this year, all of a sudden we're back up to 200,000. Um, and these pictures show you, I was down in Pacific Grove last week and I had the privilege because I was with the Washington Post reporter. They get to go places, us mortals don't. And um, got to go inside the grove and take these pictures. Um, there, are, there are actually, I heard the next day, 14,000 that are overwintering at that site. So um, if you have a chance to go, it's pretty spectacular. Um, the other site that's really heavily loaded is Pismo Beach. They have about 20,000. So um, if this is something you want to see, um, this winter is your opportunity to do that. Um, I'm not sure what's happened since we've had this storm, All they, though they were pretty hunkered down and protected in their clusters there. So this is where they spend the winter. They're basically in diapause. Uh, which is a form of hibernation. They go to the coast because it's this Goldilocks situation where it's not too hot that they have to fly around too much. Um, and it's not so cold that they freeze and the ocean uh, temperatures protect them and keep them in these clusters so that they can get through the winter and then start breeding again in the spring. Over to you. And so I, if you want to help the monarchs there in Vacaville where, you know, in Solano County, you're definitely on their mon migratory path. So having late blooming um, fall plants that are, have nectar and milkweed, it would be really good um, for your community garden to put um, some, you know, we, I have a list of plants, we'll go over that in a little bit, that bloom late in the fall because that's when they come back to the coast and they go right through, you know, the Bay Area and the Central California. 
And um, right now you'll see that the parent plant, I mean, the butterfly will drink needs nectar to keep its fat stores up. And that um, to thone, oh, I think that's um, Mexican, Mexican, oh, what, I don't even know what that plant is. Is that? I think it's Mexican marigold, but. I don't know, it looks like a coreopsis almost. So anyway, but they, you, you do have to have the late blooming. I, we talk about um, Tithonia all the time. Mexican sunflower is one of my absolute favorite plants for monarchs. I swear it's, it, they love that plant. And if you put Tithonia and um, some asters and you put milkweed in your garden, you will almost definitely get monarchs if they're flying through. Um, it's worked for us in many places. Um, and the reason why we focus so much on the butterflies and the bees, it's not just because they're pollinators, but also they're a critical, really critical part of the food web. Um, most people don't know that 75% of the food that songbirds feed their fledglings in the spring are caterpillars, 75%. So if we are wiping out caterpillars because we're afraid of infestations, we're not only wiping out um, the butterflies, we're wiping out songbirds. It's really critical. I know people don't like like oak tree moths and the, the oak, like an oak tree is huge. And if you get caterpillars on that, that's so much food for songbirds. We have to quit wiping out things because we're afraid of infestations. And why is there a decline? It's climate change, mo pesticide use. You know, everybody, like I said, everybody's afraid of an infestation and, you know, farmers are the biggest ones. Um, but if you think about when you're planting these plants, like in a community garden, you're gonna plant, you know, say dill and parsley or, um, you know, anything in the carrot family, the anise swallowtails use, but, you know, I tell people, are you going to eat every leaf of that plant? You can't share a little bit of those leaves with a caterpillar? I mean, why are you wiping them out? I mean, people are always doing that. They're petrified of sharing their food with insects. But insects are critical. We need them. We, and this is, you know, we landscape and how we landscape is that we do it the quickest and easiest way to, to maintain our landscapes, and that's too much pesticides. We have to stop the dousing of pesticides in our landscapes. Um, pollinator, these, these are all native California plants in this picture. You know, I hear a lot of people say, California natives are not very pretty. Um, I don't really want to plant them, but if you really want pollinators, especially native pollinators in your garden, you need 70% of the plants should be native because the insects have evolved with these plants that are native to the area that they're, they're from. You know, there's certain digger bees that only come out when the ceanothus start blooming. You know, they, they co-evolve together. So you need 70% and in a community garden, and if you wanna grow edibles and have a food forest, you would put your hedgerow, which would be like 70% of native plants around the edge of your garden. So you attract the beneficial insects so that you won't need to use pesticides in your edible crops because you're going to attract the beneficial um, pollinators plus you're going to also attract the beneficial um, predators that will pre predate like on the insects that are bad like the aphids and the, the other ones and they will predate on some of the the predators will predate on the caterpillars also but it's you want nature to do the balance act for you and not tip it with pesticides. Here's some of my favorite host and nectar plants for pollinators. These are native California plants. Um, the one on the top right corner where you see the little skipper butterflies and a bee, that's that's Origeron Carbon Scanna. That's I mean Origeron Wayne Roderick. It's one of my go-to plants. Um, it's very low growing, it's easy to grow. It's Once it's established, it's almost completely drought tolerant, um, but it attracts a ton of pollinators. As you can see in this picture, there's four different pollinators on one, like five flowers. Um, the other one across from it, the purple one in the upper corner, that's Facilia. If you want native bees, Facilia, 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 um, that's their favorite family of plants. 
Um, the bottom left on the bottom corner where the honeybee is, that's actually our narrow leaf milkweed, which is native to Vacaville. Um, that's, I say that's the go-to plant, um, the milkweed to plant um, in the Bay Area. It's easier to grow um, than some of the other. It's not as invasive um, as the bigger showy milkweed, but it will spread. But if you don't want it to spread throughout your garden, plant it in containers then, um, but a deep container. Um, and then poppies. You can't go wrong with poppies. Poppy, 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 poppy. Um, they're beautiful. The pollinators love them. It's definitely something we should add to all of our gardens. Here's our, on our website, I put this um, list of plants. These are bee attracting, butterfly attracting um, list. It's several pages long and I put them in the months that they bloom in the color that they bloom. So that the colors you see are actually the color of the flowers. And so in order to do a really good pollinator garden in the Bay Area and the outer Bay Area is you want 365 days of nectar and color to attract the pollinators because you'll have different pollinators in a different season. Um, this, so I try to make it really easy for gardeners to use. So this is, a, is one of a, a helpful tip that you can use is just go to our website under resources. Also at the end of this, I want to show you how to use Calscape's website where you put in your um, zip code and it'll tell you all the native plants that will attract pollinators in your area. Um, it's a super useful tool. Um, they've put a ton of work into this. And if you see at the top, you can even see where it says butterflies. It'll tell you the butterflies that your zip code will attract and the plants that will attract them. Super easy to use. Here's Tithonia, that plant I talked in Mexican sunflower, which is my absolute favorite monarch plant, but it's all the pollinators love it. That's an anise swallowtail on the Tithonia. And that's our other favorite pollinator, Terry, down there playing with the Tithonia. Um, I swear that they can see this, this from miles, like from space, I always joke about that the monarchs can see this plant from space. Um, but plant that with milkweed and some, um, some erigeron and some facilia, you're going to have a great butterfly plant. Um, another one is buckwheats, California buckwheats. Um, there's 45 different um, butterflies use buckwheats as their host plant. So it's a powerhouse. Um, if you have a small space, you want to get, you want to use plants that are going to attract several different pollinators um, to get the more bang for your buck. This is one of my favorite, the sulfur buckwheat. And you can see that's a little gray hair streak on that sulfur buckwheat. That's the one that rolls up in a dead leaf and waits out the, win the winter and comes out a butterfly in the spring. Um, here's a Nistodontia. This is a non-native plant that I use um, a lot in the Bay Area because it's winter blooming nectar for monarchs. Most people focus on summer and spring blooming things for pollinators, but if you're in the Bay Area, monarchs could be here in the winter. And so, and if you're raising honeybees, honeybees don't always go dormant in the winter because our temperatures can sometimes stay um, very mild and they're going to need to go out and um, get nectar in the winter. And this is a, this plant gets about eight feet tall, six feet tall, and it's covered with these pink flowers 365 days in the year in the Bay Area. Um, it is from South Africa. It's called Cape Mallow. You can, I usually have to get it from Annie's Annuals. It's one of the only places that I know that carries it. Um, but it is a powerhouse of a plant, but you want to put that on the back of your garden because it will get pretty tall. But it's just a go-to plant. Um, another one of my absolute favorite California plants, and this is a perfect one for a community garden, is the Verbena elicina, um, the Delamina. It is another, blooms 365 days of the year. It loves the heat. Um, in the gardens at Lake Merritt, in this time of year, when the monarchs are hovering and kind of checking, you know, sticking around in the winter, this is what the plant that you'll find the monarchs on. Um, late in the day. They just absolutely love this. Um, but all the pollinators love this one. Um, Tajidis limonii, Mexican marigold is another one. It's not native, but it's deer proof. It's very pungent, the leaves. So the, le the deer don't eat it, but it's another one that's in full bloom. This is in December. Um, 
that it'll bloom like this. So it's one of those unusual plants. Um, there's some, the facilias again, I always talk about facilias. This is one of the perennials. I love facilias. Native bees are so into facilias, but any of the facilias um, is a good choice in a native garden, in a, in a pollinator garden. There's the Erigeron glaucus, the Wayne Roderick I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's another powerhouse that blooms in the spring and summer. It's not a winter bloomer. I'm a not another non-native. If you have a garden, or this is Terry's favorite plant to put in her hell strip, you know, that strip between your sidewalk and your gutter. This is another South African plant. It's sort of distantly related to aloes. Um, and it is a just a powerhouse of a plant and it'll grow where things won't. Um, and the bees love it. It's another one of those plants to keep, you know, um, that you can use when you can't get anything else to grow. Um, and salvias, I can't say enough about salvias. It's just the native, our native salvias in California are fabulous, but there is so many amazing salvias out there that you can do. Um, the hummingbird sage, the black and blue is one of my favorite, um, but the native Clevelandii is, is a powerhouse of a, of a pollinator plant and they're easy to grow, they're drought tolerant. Um, I just love them. You can't go wrong with salvias. Um, this is the California native garden we put in. My mother, when my mother was, before she passed away, she said she didn't want a headstone with her name on it. She wanted a butterfly garden where her grandkids and great grandkids can go and look at flowers and butterflies and think of her. And so we put the word out and um, $8,000 came to our garden and we built this in her memory. Um, and I, thought about why are we putting a dumping bunch of money into cemeteries that are actually heavy polluters because I use a lot of pesticides and they're not the best thing for the, our local ecosystems but we maybe we should put create more pollinator habitat on public lands in memory of our loved ones so we started a little you know in the back of our minds like trying to get more of these out there in the world um this is a good picture that shows what you need to have real good habitat. Um, this is probably a little too big and too expansive for a community garden, but in overall, that's what you need. You need the tall trees, you need the nesting boxes, you need, we call it rockeries or shrubberies, like um, with stones or logs for the, a lot of them to go nesting in. You need all the other, you know, beetles and salamanders and frogs and, also a water feature um, on that last slide. This is why we put this water feature is you have to have a water feature for pollinators and wildlife slow moving so they can't, they don't drown trying to get water. Um, this is a sandstone um, fountain that was made by Mariposa um, Garden and Designs. They're, um, she also helped with the cobbles on this. They're second generation stonemasons. And this is a really perfect, um, water feature for um, pollinators. And when we put this in the garden every single day when I went out there, there was always something on it. Um, what can you do? Well, we need to do what we can to help address climate change. Um, we need to eliminate pesticides and herbicides at home and lobby to have them restricted. We're working really hard right now with some organizations to get neonicotinoids banned in California. And the, we don't expect you to memorize neonicotinoids, but it's really important to not use systemic pesticides. And the reason they're bad is because they stay in your soil and the plant for up to 10 years. And so you're going to the nursery, you're buying these plants to help the bees and butterflies, but when you put it in your ground, it's doused in pesticides and the, the bees and the butterflies will die when they nectar from them. So it's, it's really a bad, thing that's happening right now. And the nurseries, when we talk to them about the pesticides they use, they blame the consumer for not wanting to buy plants that are bought that have bugs on them, or if they have two holes. They're like, they don't want, the consumer's not going to buy it. So if they see their consumers going in questioning the pesticides they use, we will be able to get, make the change better. So it's really important to know where you buy your plants, what's been sprayed on it. So ask the question when you go to the nursery. If you go to, we'll, we'll put xerces.com in there too. They have a great 
um, on Xerces Society is another organization we work with and they have a great um, page that tells you how to talk to a nursery about what they're spraying on their plants. Um, we've got to provide the host plants such as milkweed, year round nectar for everyone, like we said, places for them to hang out and go through their life cycle, provide bare dirt um, in your yard for the native bees where you're not going to till and you're not going to put weed cloth. Weed cloth is another horrible thing that we invented. It's, it doesn't let nesting bees like nest in the, the ground and it really does create compaction in soil. Um, I tell people don't, please don't use weed cloth. If you want to suppress weeds, use cardboard, layers of cardboard, um, because it's going to become, um, it'll become compost later and it'll help the soil structure. I have done, I've had to undo miles and miles and miles of weed cloth that created soil compaction because that was the thing to do in the 90s was to use weed cloth. Um, and it's it's really a bad thing. Um, you can join the posse. We're, we're pretty easy. You just join the Facebook group or you can email us and learn about what our next events are or workshops. Um, we answer emails. We will come out and consult on um, properties. And like I said, I have 37, now, now it's 40 years of experience with public land. Um, and I, you know, it's about us working together and creating more um, these public places or community gardens full of pollinator habitat that's going to make a difference in this world. Um, one of our events, I try to come up with fun ways to help the environment instead of just saying don't, don't, don't. Um, so I came up with Teas for Bees where we have kids hit seed balls into the open space at golf courses with golf clubs. Um, so it's our, it's one of, our, we, we do that in several golf courses and the, I wanted them to get pressure from people because they were heavy polluters in communities, but they have so much space. And if we can get golf courses to create a critical habitat for wildlife instead of just a sports field, think about you know the how that would change the asset that they are in your community. Instead of a heavy polluter in your community, they would be critical habitat. And this is how we start the conversation. And it's been very successful. And we're going to be doing several more we worked with a golf course in Redwood, um, it's called Redwood Canyon Golf Course in Castro Valley, and now they're Audubon certified. And that's our goal, is to get these golf courses to change the way they look at their spaces. Um, and then like, and then this year, the mayor of Oakland proclaimed um, May 22nd as Pollinator Posse Day for all of our efforts and for our events like Teas for Bees and all the habitat we've created. Um, and we want other cities and other mayors to take on. Um, this is what she did after she took the um, National Wildlife Federation Monarch Mayor's Monarch Pledge, where she pledged to put in five different, um, they, have to, they have to do five different things. And one is to do a milkweed seed giveaway. Another one was to create critical habitat on public land. Um, another one was to do this, uh, um, make a proclamation about saving monarchs. And um, so we pressured the mayor and she did it. And now she's, we were the, like the largest major city on the West Coast to have the mayor do that. Now there's some other cities in the LA County that's done it that are bigger than Oakland. But this is a thing maybe we can get sustainable Solano to challenge Vacaville's mayor or Fairfield's mayor and to either be a B city USA or do the Monarch pledge. Um, and it's, it's just a good way to get, you know, public, um, just public awareness. And um, it was a three-year-old that taught me why butterflies are important. He said, Tora, you know why butterflies are important, don't you? And I'm like, no, Cole, tell me. He says, they're the fairies of our earth. They fly just like Tinkerbell. Thank you. That's the end. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. And if anybody has any questions, maybe you can raise your hand. Did Tora get a question about cutting back milkweed right now? Of course. Um, do you want to take it? Do you want me to? Um, 
There's so many opinions. You can do this one, Terry, because you're okay. right. You've been answering that question more than anybody right now. Yeah. I mean, we didn't talk about it here, but there is native milkweed and there is non-native milkweed. The native milkweed can't go wrong. Plant it, plant it, plant it. Um, around here, that's narrow leaf and showy. Um, but in any case, there's, there's no problem with that. Um, so I think someone asked, and apparently their narrow leaf has not yet gone dormant. It, it will, especially with this cold weather. And that's one of the benefits. The native milkweeds go dormant in the winter. The monarchs are at the coast. They don't need it. Um, and it clears out pathogens and all sorts of things and comes back fresh in the spring. Um, if it's around, if milkweeds around in the winter, it can distract them from migrating. Um, and I will tell you, there is some controversy about this, but we're going with the reliable science we're getting from Xerxes Society and Monarch Joint Venture. Um, so the non-native milkweed, which you would recognize it because it has orange and yellow flowers, both of the natives have kind of whitish pinkish flowers, or it gets really big round seed balls, the balloon plant version. Those are the two non-natives you're most likely to run into. Uh, the problems with them are they don't go dormant in the winter, so they tend to accumulate um, this disease called OE for short, um, which is transmitted through the plant from monarch to monarch. Um, and even if you cut it back frequently, that tends to increase in the population. So you we really suggest if you've got it, cut it back and then replace it. Um, at this time of year, it's a little bit tricky because there may be caterpillars on it and there is... Um, because of monarch status in California right now as a species of extreme conservation concern, you're not allowed to interfere with them in any way. Um, you can't move caterpillars, you can't put them in cages, you can't cut down a plant that they're on. Um, so if you do have caterpillars, check. If you do cut back the branches the caterpillars aren't on, they should be finishing up pretty quickly um, and then cut it back to the ground. And ideally, plant some um, native milkweed to replace it. So what, that's what will come up in the spring. Did I, I think I covered all that. <laughs> yeah. There's one question from Trailhead Cabin, I think, yeah. um, about Las Vegas. Yeah, Xerxes Society and Monarch Joint Venture are national organizations. So we definitely can connect you to someone who can help you in Las Vegas. Um, so if you email us at pollinatorposse.org, we will definitely connect you to folks out there. We work actually pretty closely with an organization um, out of Arizona, too. Um, there's a monarch organ that's part of our Western Monarchs Advocates, and they work with Circes out there. And if you have a half acre of raw land, there's a lot of grants out there right now for um, people that have working land to create pollinator habitat. Um, we work with, you know, Monarch Joint Venture connects us with all of those accesses. So it's, there's definitely, if you have land, this is the time to get connected to groups. Um, I've never seen so much money being put into pollinator habitat ever um, in my 40 years. So um, that's, you know, I'm hoping that I can connect even so sustainable Solano to help with some of their projects um, with that too, with some funding. So anybody else have any questions? I don't see any hands being raised. Thanks everyone. What nurseries around here do we recommend where we can buy start seeds for the native plants you mentioned? Um, in Solano County? Uh, I can. I think um, like Bloom's nurseries in Petaluma they usually provide plants for a lot of the local nurseries. If you go into a nursery and it has a blooms tag on it, they do not use neonicotinoids. They're actually a really good, um, Annie's Annuals doesn't use neonics. Uh, there's a lot of, I would stick to like native plant nurseries or your master gardeners nurseries or anything that doesn't ship across state lines. If they ship their product across state line, the state forces them to spray with pesticides because they don't want invasive insects crossing state lines. You know, and that's how the infestations start is these, you know, non-native insects 
getting moved by plants. They're in the plant. So it's, it's an ugly, yeah, UC Arboretum has a really good selection of native plants. Um, there's also Tilden Botanical Garden up in Berkeley. If you wanna go down there, um, they have a great, but there's Watershed Nursery, Plowshed Nursery. Um, we can, I can email Gabriella a list um, and we're going to be putting, we're going to be rebuilding our website. We'll be putting a list of um, nurseries that we use. I like, you know, the ones that we use are usually associated with a, um, either a plant society or um, I guess for you guys, it's not that far to go to Cal Flora. Oh, you have um, the Morning Star, is it Morning Star Herb Farm up there in Vacaville? They're fantastic. You know, that's yes, going to suggest them. They, yeah, yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, they don't use, yeah, that's probably your closest really good source. I'm not sure though if they carry milkweed. Um, but I know Annie's does, and they only use BT, they don't use neonics, they don't use any sustain, um, systemics. So, um, that would be, thank you, it was very interesting, so excited to create. Thank you, everyone. This is, I'm excited to see this many people wanting to listen to this talk. Um, and we're gonna be helping more also with the community garden that's gonna get built. So we can probably have another workshop in the spring, you know, um, maybe at the site or even Zoom, where we can see if people actually, you know, if they got, oh, there it is. Thank you, Gabriella. She put Morning Star, Morning Sun Herb Farm in the chat. It's a great, uh, I, I really like that. Um, we actually bought one of the new community gardens we're working with in San Mateo actually went all the way up to Morning Sun Herb Farm just to buy their lavenders. Um, a good thing to do in a community garden is to do a, lab a lavender labyrinth. Even though it's not a native plant, the bees and butterflies love it. And it's an aromatherapy product and it's good for wellness and, you know, making some kind of spiral that you can put um, lavender in so people can meditate and walk around it and smell it and also attract pollinators. It's also another good community garden kind of thing to do. Um, anybody have any other questions? Can I add a couple things, Tora? Yeah. So number one, um, if you have more questions or you want to know more detail, um, more extensive versions of this talk are available on our website under resources. Um, there's also a podcast interview we did that actually turned into two sessions because there was so much to talk about. So if you want more information, that's a really good resource. The other thing is um, we have gotten very heavily involved in community science, um, gathering data, particularly on monarchs, um, because that wasn't happening here in Northern California. And um, the situation has been changing pretty drastically and we're trying to understand that. So if you are out in your garden and you're observing, um, if you're noticing caterpillars, if you're noticing um, monarchs, or if you're not, because lack of data is equally important, uh, we have a regular group of people who report on a monthly basis. They just fill out a survey. Um, and that data, now we've been doing that for two years, is, is proven to be really useful to the scientists and the conservation groups that are making policy. So if you're someone that's willing to do that on a monthly basis, we would really appreciate it. And you can read about that um, on the projects page on our website. Um, it describes the project and gives you the link to the survey. So I would really appreciate having more people up your direction as part of our database. Okay, done. So Leslie, um, you, I see that you're based in Benicia and she said she's seen a bunch more monarchs. You're, you're actually, Benicia Vallejo is at that, because it's just this side of the hill, they probably had breeding monarchs last winter and your, your information is super important, like Vallejo, Benicia, um, Cordelia, Sassoon, anybody who has a milkweed in that area is really critical. It, you know, it's really important data. But also in Benicia, you have pipe vine swallowtails right over across the, 
the um, in Port Costa, there's a lot of them. You could be growing pipevine, California pipevine, and you could get some great pipevine. That's the black and blue butterfly. And they definitely, you know, we need more people to plant the California native pipevine plants because it just, the flower isn't that pretty. So it's just weird and strange looking. So people stopped planting it. And that's what happens when she, the plant is gone, the butterfly is gone. But, and they're super fun to, to get in your yard because they come in like in groups. It's usually not one single butterfly. It'll, they'll be, they like several of them will come and they're just gorgeous. So um, if you're in Benicia, Vallejo, that right along the water there, that's, they, they're kind of a riparian butterfly. They like to be around creeks and streams and bays and rivers and stuff. But I know in Port Costa, if you go under the, there's like tresses for the railroad that you'll see a ton of chrysalis from pipevine. If you look up underneath the railroad trusses, um, they like to go to chrysalis there. Um, and I, so I know you have quite a good population out there. And another thing to think about if you, skippers, and I didn't, I forgot to talk about this. Skippers use grasses. So putting bunch grasses in your pollinator garden um, is important because what's happening is the skippers are laying their eggs on lawn and, and grasses, and then we mow it and we wipe out their eggs. So putting bunch grasses that you don't mow or the native no mow is a good way to attract pollinators too. So Knight's Landing, yay, you have some great pollinators out there too. Yeah, please contact us if you want us to help you on some projects. And we're always looking for other people to come help, you know, volunteer. We're all volunteer based. Um, we all we can also use donations. We're trying to, all the donations that we get, um, a, gi a giant <laughs> portion of it goes to seed and plants that we get into the ground for these projects. So um, we love to get donations. <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting us, Gabriella. Um, the posse, I'm not sure where you heard me talk before, but because I, I heard you say that you met me a couple years ago, but you were tabling. Huh? <laughs> you were tabling, and I just randomly walked out to your table. Oh, where? Uh, the Tomato Expo, the Harlem Expo. Uh, oh, the Heirloom Festival. Yeah, Heirloom. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, we, that was one of our, that one's crazy. <laughs> that <laughs> one, there was like 1,700 kids that came through in a couple days, and it was fun. It, I, we love doing that kind of stuff. Um, you can check out um, on the resources. Terry just did a fantastic um, video with Mama Wanda's garden um, videos about pollination, and that was one of the places where we learned where even adults really don't know how pollination works and how to talk to kids about it. So Terry did this fabulous video. If you're an educator or you've worked with kids um, or if you don't and you're an adult and you don't know what pollination is, um, that's a cute little video to watch. Um, yeah, does anybody else have any other questions for either um, Tora or Terry? Mosaic Community Garden. Chula Vista. Chula Vista, wow. Cool. Yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you for caring about pollinators. Um, we can get this done. Look at, you know, just doing outreach and no one knows why the numbers jumped the way they did, but um, we're gonna take a little tiny bit of credit for it. <laughs> only because we can. So, hey, well, thank you so much, Terry and Tora, for um, oh, um, for being asked to unmute the Mosaic Community Garden. Oh yeah, person. yeah, we should unmute them so they can ask us questions. Um, Allison, I I don't know how to do it. Can you? I just did. I asked her to unmute herself. Yeah, she should be able to. Or they should be able to unmute themselves. There she goes. Uh, good evening, ladies and whoever participants. Uh, I'm Gloria Berry. I'm the CEO and of a nonprofit, the Mosaic Community Garden here in Chula Vista, which is South San Diego. Um, we've been in existence for seven years, and we've been out of the seven, we've been a monarch waste station for four of them. 
And this is this coming year, hopefully we're gonna be doing some tagging. Uh, I've got a I've got a stronger board members who believe in believe in what we do. And that's really important to have a good support staff and good sponsorship. So um, um, we're looking at um, incorporating more of our because as, as an all-American display garden, we're actually edibles as well as flowers. So we're going to be hosting this year more flowers than edibles. So hopefully to build up our um, our impact here in the pollinating area, because there's not many of us. We're the only uh, community garden here in Chula Vista area. And, wow. uh, so we have um, we've got a lot to do. So we just we just transitioned our garden uh, on the upper part of the property. So we're rebuilding. So we've got a lot on our plate, a lot to do, and uh, I'm really really glad that Solano team here has um, allowed me to join in and um, share. And uh, we all need to um, to uh, continue on with what we're doing. Maybe we'll get some more funding. So uh, that always helps out. So I appreciate your time and continue on and look forward to more presentations. Thank you. Did How many acres do you have? Uh, we have just shy of one. But um, I've got fruit That's trees, good. yeah, and I've got um, reestablishing ourselves. So uh, we have less property, but more impact. And um, we get, I get to design the garden instead of somebody else that doesn't really have an impact. So um, that's really important for us here. And we're very secluded. We, we don't have a lot of, um, I'm gonna call it wildlife here besides the stuff that fly and, and crawl. So um, that's, that's welcoming. So we're lucky to hang on to some of that um, harvesting material that we have growing here. So that's really grateful. So we're yeah, looking for, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, if you email us, we we actually work with people in Southern California. We can connect you some for some, you know, with some of the other people that we work with and, you know, maybe connect you to help you get some more funding. Oh, perfect. Um, for pollinator habitat. So, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, something, even something as small as what we're doing now is just kind of minuscule, but it really makes an impact in our community is, is we take recycling um, aluminum cans and bottles and all that in our budget goes actually to maintaining anything we need for the monarchs. So um, people have, they'll go out of their way to drop those items off to us, knowing that that's where the funding is going. So it creates much more networking and impact in our community. And it causes people to come into the garden and participate with us with workshops and fun and um, classes and, and art projects that we have going on too. So it creates a networking and opportunity for for the, for the residents to uh, participate with us as well. Mm -hmm. And educate them. <laughs> well, congratulations. Sounds thank like you you're doing a great job. We're trying. <laughs> thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to be conscious of folks' time. It's already 6.06. Um, uh, there's actually a, a, a message from a Facebook viewer that I would like to, to share with everyone. Um, it says, awesome information. I'm into planting native plants here in Martinez, milkweed, verbenas, passion flowers, poppies. I'll be planting more from your recommendations. Excellent. Martinez is a perfect location too. Yeah. We actually, I actually just did a talk for the uh, Martinez Adult School um, last month in November. I did a talk. Um, I actually work really closely with Lori Caldwell, the compost gal out there in Martinez. Um, I did it for her. It was her class. So we're working with people in Martinez too. Um, there's some definitely some projects out there that they want to get more pollinator. So good for you. Martinez is a great spot. That's another overwintering site possible breeding in the winter site. So information about monarchs is really important that we get from Martinez. All righty. Well, again, thank you so much to the both of you. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, have a good rest of your day, and we look forward to to seeing more of each other. Hopefully, yeah, we'll be we'll be helping you with your community garden. And thanks for inviting us. We we appreciate the invite. Thank you, and spreading the word. Bye bye. Bye everyone.